everybody, and thank you for being with us tonight. I am Pastor Colin Curtis, and I serve here at Holy Cross Lutheran Church. And this is my colleague, uh, Marky Goman. She is a licensed professional clinical counselor. Oh my goodness, you have to practice that, right? From, yes, from Lutheran Social Services. And I'm going to let her introduce herself uh, more formally in just a few minutes. Nine years ago, I came to Maple Lake as a pastoral intern and was installed in my official capacity in June of 2013. I've said it before, I'll say it again, it continues to be a great privilege of my life to serve as a pastor and to do this holy work in this community is a blessing to my family and to me. Tonight's agenda and the purpose of these monthly gatherings is an outgrowth of my own ministry experience. In December of 2014, I was celebrating Christmas with my family in South Dakota. And when I received the word that one of our parishioners had died by suicide. Before the age of 27, and even before I had a year of full-time ministry under my belt, I was thrust into saying something about mental health from a theological perspective. It's a both and, by the way mental health and theology. Within a few months of that funeral, I took a mental health first aid course and began to look for resources, support, and services for mental health for our community. With a couple of exceptions in Buffalo, I discovered that most mental health resources were in the Twin Cities or in St. Cloud. And so, with busy schedules and work commitments, uh, that may not be really all that accurate. Before the pandemic, then, I started to have more and more conversations with people about mental health, mental wellness. I've asked Marky to say something that oftentimes we think about mental health as being a crisis, but it's not. We all have mental health and mental wellness. I think that's an important thing to uh, be mindful of. But as I was having those conversations, I was able to offer pastoral care, but I was sensing that there was a need for more professional mental health resources in our community. And so uh, in the deep recesses of my mind, I remembered that my home church had a partnership with the counseling service through Lutheran Social Services. And so I made a phone call. And after a few conversations, Marky was sent to Maple Lake in February of 2020, right before the pandemic, mm -hmm. and started serving within the city limits of this community once a week. She's been going gangbusters ever since. <laughs> so I'm gonna let Marky introduce herself now. All right, thank you. I appreciate that welcome and for bringing me here because it's been a blessing. Um, thank you for getting this started off and for welcoming me into the community. Um, I have thoroughly enjoyed it. started right before the pandemic because while well, we went through the pandemic together yeah. every single week talking about numbers talking about the impact it was having on us it really didn't affect a whole lot of my time here yeah. like i was busy people kept coming i was still in person it, it was just a crazy experience um but backing up to that my journey at lutheran social service started four years ago when i was fresh out of grad school providing services um, in the Elk River School District and a couple of other places for a lot of high schoolers. Um, and then I was approached with this opportunity to come and serve here uh, in Maple Lake for this church, but also for this community. And at first, when I was approached by it, by my director, I was like, how am I gonna make this work? What am I gonna have to sacrifice? But there was so much excitement as well because I love, I love new opportunities. I love pushing myself and growing. I'm not a public speaker, but I love doing stuff like this tonight. So pardon me while I get all red and blotchy and it's just, it's what it is. Um, but that, that's what brought me here. So I think it's just a huge testament to this community and to this church and to Pastor Colin's work, how sustainable this has been for the past year and a half to the fact that I'm actually this week, I'm here two days a week now instead of one day a week because we have grown and the need is there, um, which is an unfortunate thing, but it's also such a wonderful thing that I can be here to provide it. So this field, this conversation, these community gatherings, 
are really kind of a passion project for both Pastor Colin and I. Over the last year and a half, we've had so many conversations about mental health, me learning about this church, and just learning more about theology and, and the faith system myself. Um, and we've come across many themes that we want to be able to speak to in the community that have been coming up in clients, that have been coming up in church, that have just been coming up in the community. Um, which is how they intersect. So we, we get intersections. <laughs> all him, all him. Um, but how they, how they are adjacent in both of our lives. Um, everyone that I see here, well, I shouldn't say everyone, almost everyone that I see here um, at the church, whether they're a community member or whether they're somebody from the church, has brought some sort of spiritual or faith-based background which has really pushed me to incorporate that. Um, because one of my favorite things about mental health and incorporating faith or incorporating spirituality is it provides a guidepost of hope and it provides a support network without even having to look into the depths or the recesses of ourselves. So our hope with this is to begin having conversations with the community and with you all about struggles and experiences um, and to bridge that faith and mental health perspective together for you. While sometimes different journeys and approaches, there's usually more similarities and connections than differences. Uh, the struggles around mental health have been around for a long time. In several gospel accounts in the New Testament, we hear of individuals who are wrestling with mental and emotional pain. They are the people who are sick, those who are uh, what the Bible calls demon-possessed, and even those who become social outcasts due to illness or family crisis, who now find themselves on the outskirts of society and completely isolated from relationship and or the support of the larger community. Jesus himself intervened in the lives of these individuals seeking their healing, uh, holistic wellness and restoration to community. And throughout the book of Acts, we see Jesus' followers doing that same sort of work. They are caring for the poor and the widows, tending to the lives of the physically and mentally unwell. And we even see two followers of Jesus intervene in a potential death by suicide. The people of God following the example of Jesus have been actively involved in individual and community wellness from the inception of Jesus' ministry in the early church. The church has always been aware and involved in these concerns as well. But over 500 years ago, one man found himself at an intersection between faith and mental health. I know it's kind of exciting. We get kind of geeky about how many times we can throw this in. Martin Luther was a German monk and an eventual reformer of the church, and he was plagued by one question. In the eyes of God, am I a good person? Luther's conscience would convict him of being an unworthy sinner, and he was convinced that he was never good enough. One day, he was caught in a fierce thunderstorm. I think almost all Lutherans know this, some iteration of this story. Uh, and while the lightning flashed and the thunder cracked, it brought Luther's conscience to the surface. And he entered into a plea bargain with God. If his life would be spared, he would become a monk. Robert Kolb says he was scared stiff before a wrathful God. Luther hoped that punishing himself for his own sins would then make him more pleasing to God. He beat himself, he fasted for days, slept outside in the cold, but the extreme austerity just didn't seem to be working for him. Luther still felt the guilt of his sin. He found nothing to ease his conscience of the burden and weight of that sinful being. He tried confession and found little assurance. Cardinal Dolan, uh, a leader in the Catholic Church, explained it that it dawned on Luther, I don't feel saved. I don't feel happy or at peace. I feel unable to earn or achieve God's love 
and mercy. Well, the Germans have a word. I promised that you'd learn German words tonight. Uh, Germans have a word for this sort of severe mental oppression and deep despair. It's called Anfechtungen. You want to give it a try? Anfechtungen. Tungen. Tungen. Yep. Anfechtungen. It is the combination of spiritual terror, temptation and trial by the devil, and typically becomes a religious crisis. That's how it's defined. Later, he, Luther would explain these spiritual tri trials were so great and so much like hell that no tongue could adequately express them, no pen could describe them, and one who had not himself experienced them could not believe that they were real. And so great were they that if they would have been sustained or lasted for a half hour or even for one tenth of an hour, he, speaking of himself, would have perished completely and all of his bones would have been reduced to ashes. At such time, God seems so terribly angry and with him the whole creation. At such time, there is no flight, no comfort within or without, but all things seem to accuse. In this moment, it is strange to say, the soul cannot believe that it can ever be redeemed. Some might identify this as a crisis of conscience or cycle, a psychic affliction. And for Luther, it wasn't deeper than that, and it wasn't more serious. Both mental and spiritual well-being are pretty darn serious, I think. But it was different. In other places, Luther used the Latin word tentatio, to describe it to people. Tentatio is where we get our English word for tension. Uh, and so tentatio is like getting caught in between the gears of something. And Luther would say probably the gears of affliction, oppression, and persecution. The central question that troubled Luther, am I a good person before God, as well as his own deep distress, could only find one answer. And for Luther, it was the comfort of God's promise as revealed in Holy Scripture. Righteousness, that is, to have a right relationship with God, and salvation, that is, God's saving act on behalf of humanity, could not be earned, merited, or bought by human beings. Rather than the God he had created in his mind, it was the Holy Scriptures that revealed that God's favor was grace, a free gift, accomplished by Christ and not Luther, and Jesus' death and resurrection. It was this grace, these gifts that were received by faith, what we would say is a deep trust in God and God's promises. And it became astoundingly good news. From here on out, it became his life's work to dig deeper into God's word. That's what gave him his purpose. And then to find and to share the mercy, grace, and love of God with others. From here on out, Luther would engage in the practice of yet another German world, uh, word, Zeilsorge. Give it a try. Zeilsorge. That one's a little easier, I think. Although Megan uh, instructed me that I wasn't pronouncing it right. It's actually Zeilsorge. Yeah, Zeil. There's two E's. She, yeah, she knows German. Zielsorge is more than just self-care, okay? But actually, in, in German, it means the cure of the soul. It is the work of giving our full attention and steadfast care to troubled souls by weaving together the human and the divine stories in order to live faithfully and responsibly with others and with God. I'm going to read that definition again. It is the work of giving our full attention and steadfast care to troubled souls by weaving together the human and divine stories in order to live faithfully and responsibly with others and with God. Luther believed that God's word could truly comfort and console the aching heart and the troubled mind. 
And that was not the only thing. Luther comforted and counseled others with scriptural promises. In many of his pastoral correspondence, you see a pastor in the throes of a spiritual battle, wrestling for the lives of parishioners by fending off the devil through what he used, scripture and prayer. But also, he understood, probably from his own personal experience, and the support that he received from his monastery fellow brother monks, that there are additional coping skills and support that are needed. In one letter, he writes to the wife of a despondent man. That's the title that the, the letter is given. And this is what he says. Be careful not to leave your husband alone for a single moment. And leave nothing lying about with which he might harm himself. Solitude is the problem for him. For this reason, the devil drives him to it. There is no harm in your reading or telling him stories, news, curiosities, even if some of them are idle talk, gossip, and fables, as long as they excite him to laughter and jesting. Then quickly recite comforting verses from the scriptures. Whatever you do, do not leave him alone. And be sure that his surroundings are not so quiet that he sinks into his own thoughts. It doesn't matter if he becomes angry about this. Act as if it were disagreeable to you, Luther writes, and scold about it. But let it be done all the more. Christ, who causes you such heartache, will help you, even as he has done recently. Hold fast to him. You are the apple of his eye. Whatever touches you touches him. Amen. Developed by his own personal struggle and experiences of pastoral care, Luther's faith helped him tread the path of life and find other intersections of support and coping skills that strengthen both the mental and emotional well-being in addition to the great spiritual comfort of Jesus Christ the Savior. Did Martin Luther ever... Did he attain more confidence? I mean, or did he always struggle with that almost his whole life about I'm not worried? Yeah, I think he does. I, I think you see him really struggling with it his whole life. And not only that, but also with every new situation. I mean, he found himself in his own personal struggle when he was in the monastery. Then he goes after the Catholic Church. I mean, that's a powerful, uh, I mean, that's a monster of a system to start attacking. And when that happens, uh, Luther, I think, has to struggle with what that's going to look like. Mm -hmm. And then there's the trouble with, uh, you know, the politics in Germany at the time. And he becomes responsible for a lot of those tensions, too. And so then you see him carrying those. And over and over and over again, it's sort of a new struggle, I think. Um, but he always is coming back um, and, and talks about the comfort of the scriptures. Once Luther uh, becomes this great reformer, and he no longer has time to be preaching in Wittenberg, he always finds himself in the seat for daily chapel. And um, he often speaks of Pastor Bugenhagen as uh, you know, the, the voice box of God for himself, because he was having that, that daily interaction with God's word and the promises of God. Mark is going to respond, uh, and then we'll open up for larger conversation. So, from what Pastor just shared, I can see many different aspects of Luther wrestling with himself and within his mental health. There was a piece that you read tonight that I, when we were talking about it, didn't stand out to me, that I'm going to reread. Um, so, it said, he found nothing to ease his conscience of, conscience of the burden and the weight of his sin. He tried confession, but found little assurance. Um, Cardinal Dolan explained, it yeah. still dawned on him, I don't feel saved, I don't feel happy or at peace, I feel unable to earn and achieve God's love and mercy. And tonight what that really struck out for me was a lot of times when we're struggling with mental health, individually, depression, anxiety, trauma, we don't feel a lot of relief from it. It kind of is something that carries with us day to day, week to week. It's 
might be something that we may feel a little bit eased from, but it's often still in the back of our mind. This is when it's at its heightened, when we're not using our skills, when we're not having the support, when we're really struggling. Um, so I, I, I wanted to point that out tonight, and now I'm gonna pivot to what I had planned to say. <laughs> that was off script, pardon me. <laughs> so Luther used his faith as a pillar to guide him through his journey in life. Um, through a mental health lens, I really see Luther struggling with how to make his value of God, of his faith, the thing that guides him through the shame, the pain, the hurt of not feeling like he was living in full accordance with what God expected him to live, the way God expected him to live. Um, creating a huge disconnect in his life. Um, of knowing what was important to him and what he valued more than anything, but struggling to remain free of sin and to be living out that value in the way he saw fit. Um, instead of just running away, though, Luther continues to try and bargain, in a sense, with God over right from wrong and how to be living in a godly way. He doesn't give up. He doesn't run away. He doesn't take a different path. He continues to bargain. He continues to try and be better each and every day. Um, we can't begin to imagine what it was like during that time period, especially because mental health wasn't really a thing that was a huge component of lives back then. Um, well, and we also can't begin to imagine what Luther's state of mind truly was and what all of those were. We just have these pieces of his thoughts. We weren't inside of it. But we can recognize that from the mental health lens, there were some important coping skills, there were some important tools um, that may have benefited him. And so that's where we're gonna spend the rest of our planned time tonight with opportunity for discussion. So shout out questions if you have them, if they come up. So I wanna talk a little bit about what mental health skills are. Um, whether we're trying to manage our own stresses or, why, or trying to support those that we care about, these are basic skills that we can take with us day to day and apply towards mental health that we see. Um, and oftentimes we're already doing it without even realizing it. So a lot of these might sound like, oh yeah, I got that, I do that, which is great. Just keep reinforcing those. So the first one that I wanna talk about is empathy versus sympathy. Has anyone seen Brene Brown's video on, <laughs> thank you, I just saved that. <laughs> <laughs> It's a really great like five minute video, I wanna say, where it visually depicts the difference of treating someone with sympathy and treating someone with empathy. They all have their place. It's not to say that sympathy isn't a beautiful, wonderful thing, um, but they do each have their place. So sympathy is, I feel sorry for you, and empathy is sitting with them in the muck of what they're experiencing and not trying to fix it for them. It's seeing them in their pain and all and witnessing that and relating it to a piece of your life where you can kind of relate to how they were feeling. So empathizing um, with an experience that might be different from theirs, but still evokes a similar emotion. So really just getting in, in the video, it shows them climbing into a deep hole actually. It's climbing into that deep hole with the person and sitting with them and just holding space. Um, I will find it and I will give it to you at the end, but it's Brene Brown, um, Empathy versus Sympathy on YouTube, should bring it up. And we can watch it after we yes. stop recording. Um, absolutely, we can pull it up. Um, so the next, the next skill or strategy that I want to re reinforce is listening to hear versus listening to respond. Mm -hmm. um, so oftentimes when we're having a conversation with somebody, we get an idea or we have our retort that we want to say back and as soon as that comes to our mind whether we realize it or not we are no longer listening to what that person is still saying we're focused on responding and giving them our retort i find it myself doing it all the time of like what mm -hmm. take it back take it back let them finish listen and then share what we want to do um so again not interrupting and also hearing them out in their entirety versus letting our minds stop when we start to have our response formulated. Um, the last one, this is my favorite, is connection and purpose. I clump them together because I view them similar. They're, they're very different, but I view them in a very similar lens of, to me, one of the 
most important asset of mental well-being is to feel connected and or to have a purpose. And oftentimes connection will lead us to purpose. Um, that is having our social, social connection, that's having our network of people at the church, that's having a wonderful pastor, a wonderful partner, a wonderful group of friends. Um, it can also be non-people, whatever we feel connected to. I am one, I can go into nature and feel at peace and connected to a completely different realm of things than I can feel with people. So a connection with nature, things like that. So connection and purpose, those are the last Two, and then I want to talk briefly about coping. So the, I'm a definition person, so bear with me. Um, the definition of coping is consciously putting effort in to solve personal and interpersonal problems to minimize and tolerate stress and conflict. The definition of coping strategies are the things we spend mental energy doing to reduce stress and return to our baseline. So we all have a variety of things that we already do as coping strategies. We often just don't think about them in that lens. Um, these can range from reading books, taking a warm shower, drinking a warm tea, working out. Um, so eating. Eating. <laughs> that, one, that one can walk a fine line sometimes. But yes. <laughs> yes. Especially chocolate. It can create oh, problems. See now, don't get... Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. There's a connection here. <laughs> so, it's, no, the, the funny part of that is chocolate actually is a releaser of serotonin. I believe mm. that's the correct hormone. So eating chocolate actually releases a hormone in our body that makes us feel good. So, especially dark chocolate. There's more serotonin right. in dark chocolate go. than no chocolate. Go. We're on. Um, Where is it? But yes, we should. Next time, goes for next time. We'll okay, need our chocolate next time. Um, but no, yes, chocolate is a wonderful thing. Exercise mm -hmm. releases endorphins, which makes us feel pleasure, which makes us feel good. And actually, any of those can be extreme. Right? Yes, so absolutely. So exercise to you know, release stress is a coping method, but I can also do it to get through the yes. stress and destruction. Yes. So I, I don't have this matrix. I can draw it on the board if you guys want, and this was a little bit off not my, my plan tonight, but the way that I often will talk to clients or conceptualize things is through this matrix of, um, you're both lefties. I know, isn't that funny? I'm too. You are too? Yeah. I'm surrounded by <laughs> strategy for stress might be working out, right? But when we take it to the extreme, it's now becoming an unhealthy. Same with food. Food can be a comfort for us. It might be more of a passive coping strategy because we're not necessarily working through the thing that is causing us stress. It's just giving us comfort. But when we take it to the extreme of either under or over